Hello, thank you for joining me on this short presentation on how I perform ultrasound guided paravertebral blocks. Uh, I initially delivered this talk in 2019 in Lausanne and I have adapted it for Blocker Girls online course. I will also be hosting this video on my YouTube channel, so please do scan the QR code if you're interested in finding out more. Uh, here are my disclosures. The only one really relevant is that I will be using the Complete Anatomy app from 3D4 Medical, which I think really makes a difference to understanding anatomy. It will come as no surprise to you, I think the paravertebral block is the king of blocks, and I'm hoping that you will feel the same way too. So how did I start my interaction with paravertebral blocks? Well, during my training, I only did two, uh, and um, I then became a consultant and took on a breast list. So I learned how to do paravertebral blocks from John McDonald, pictured on the left here, uh, and I was lucky enough to also be inspired by Dr. Manoj Kamaka, one of the godfathers of ultrasound-guided paravertebral blocks. So from those two people, my passion for paravertebral blocks uh, um, developed, and I started doing regular paravertebral blocks for my, rest, for my breast list. And I guess, as they say, the rest is history. So when we look at the potential benefits for paravertebral blocks, there are many purported benefits. The effect on acute and chronic pain, opioid requirements, nausea and vomiting, and maybe even cancer recurrence, as well as the ability to ambulate patients quicker, uh, to have better patient-reported outcome measures, and the ability to avoid general anesthesia in certain cases. And I think the evidence in many of those situations has been proven. Chronic pain, it's a bit variable depending upon which papers you read, and we haven't yet and may never get that evidence for the impact on cancer recurrence. That being said, why do I continue to deliver paravertebral blocks? Well, it's undoubtedly because the quality of analgesia is fantastic. I notice an opioid sparing effect, which is relevant in today's day and age. It's a reliable and predictable technique with a fabulous recovery profile and in certain select cases, I can avoid the delivery of a general anaesthetic. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to be covering a bit about paravertebral space anatomy, sonoanatomy, and then tell you how I insert the blocks with some tips and tricks. Let's start off with anatomy. So initially, we have a look at the space here, and we take away the skin, we've got trapezius, deep to trapezius, the rhomboid muscles, and then the erector spinae complex of muscles. We then remove all of that and we get in closer, we can see the transverse processes, are, which are a key landmark. We have a look now, what we'll notice are a few things. If we zoom in on this video over here, you'll notice you've got the uh, spinous processes, uh, the vertebral bodies and the transverse processes. And because of the nature of the thoracic vertebral bodies, you'll notice the spinous process of the vertebra above slants down over the vertebral body below. And that's relevant when we scan later. We'll zoom in on the space here, and I've highlighted a green structure that passes from the rib below to the transverse process above. Now, that structure is really important, and certainly in my formative training, the superior costotransverse ligament, which I've highlighted here, was key. And you can see here, looking at this, um, this approach, this is how we would be approaching the paravertebral space if we were coming in from a transverse in-plane orientation. You can see the proximity to the lung or the pleura. So in the past, we used to think that the superior costotransverse ligament acted as a gateway, uh, a barrier to the paravertebral space, and we had to break through that barrier in order to get local anaesthetic into the paravertebral space. And that's certainly the way I practiced my uh, anaesthesia up until relatively recently. And then with this paper that came out, we described the MTP block, the midpoint between transverse process, the pleura, we now call it the intertransverse process block, what we noticed that actually in some circumstances, if the needle was behind the superior crossotransverse ligament, you still got analgesia and in some cases anesthesia. This paper in May 2021 effectively helped understand why that situation was working. What it did was it elucidated the true anatomy of the paravertebral space. And in fact, when you look at the superior crossotransverse ligaments, there are slits, a medial slit and a lateral slit around it and they provide a really tangible area or a route for how local anaesthetic injected in the retro-superior costotransverse ligament space, the space behind the costotransverse ligament, how local anaesthetic injected there may actually still get into the paravertebral space. And that's a very reasonable uh, assumption now. And that helps us to explain perhaps why the erector spinae plane block might work and certainly why the intertransverse process block might work. What about sonoanatomy? 
So um, I've captured these images using a Butterfly IQ probe, and we're going to start off with a Paramedian sagittal scan. Uh, I start here with a probe intentionally laterally over the ribs, um, because I want to be able to spot the transition from ribs to the transverse processes. So let's start over here. Um, as I slow, slowly slide the probe from lateral to medial, you see the ribs dive down, and then they become replaced by sort of flat, very tombstone or rectangular appearance of the transverse processes. I've slightly obliqued the cordite part of the probe, and you can appreciate here the, the shadow of the transverse process with an underlying rib, and on the, on the right hand side, the lower uh, shadow of the rib, you can see the superior costo transverse ligament, the pleura, and the space between them is a paravertebral space. What about the transverse scan? So here I've got the probe starting from the midline, and I'm scanning over the spinous process. Now that spinous process will be from the space above because of the way the spinous process uh, slants down. But we're going to start from the midline and scan laterally, and I aim to keep the spinous process, the vertebral body, the transverse process, and the long axis of the rib all in one line to start off with. So let's see that process happening here. Spinous process, lamina, transverse process coming over the long axis of the rib. And at this point, then I bring the probe down and I try to ensure that I maintain the transverse process on the medial aspect of the screen so I know that the, the probe is not going too medial towards the central neural axis. And here now you can appreciate the difference between the rib and the pleura. And you can see here the internal intercostal membrane acting as that gateway into the paravertebral space, but actually maybe not as much of a gateway as we thought. What about actually block insertion? I'm going to go through some of the essentials. It's really important you take consent, you have full monitoring, you have intravenous access with sedation, full asepsis, and of course an ultrasound machine. Why is monitoring so important? Well, here is a video of a patient who was in the process of having a paramedian sagittal paravertebral block incited, inserted, and you can see they had a vasovagal. The only indication that they were feeling unwell was the fact that the heart rate dropped from 80 beats per minute down to 40 beats per minute. Uh, up until that point, they were talking, they were absolutely fine. So it's really important you have monitoring in situ. Now, let's talk about needle insertion. There are a number of approaches that have been described over the, over the years, uh, either with a transverse probe orientation or a paramedian sagittal probe orientation, and then you can needle in plane or out of plane. Well, I summarise these literally by having this table over here. So transverse probe orientation, needling in plane or out of plane, um, or a paramedian needling in plane or out of plane, and my personal preference is in plane needling. So if we'd start off with paramedian sagittal in plane, uh, this is where the needle is taking uh, its route. You can see on the uh, skeleton above, we're coming in over the transverse process at the cordite aspect and aiming to pop that, that needle into the local anaesthetic uh, target where the paravertebral space is. Now, paramedian sagittal approach is difficult in patients with either high or low body mass index. High body mass index because there's a large degree of tissue between the skin uh, and where you need to get to, and low body mass index patients, sometimes because the intertransverse process space can actually be quite small and quite narrow to get into. Now, sometimes people who have what one would describe as average body mass index have thick paraspinous tissue. Um, and actually, so there are a number of reasons why, why paramedian sagittal may not work. With a transverse in-plane, uh, you can see with the probe orientated along that long axis, the rib, you're coming in from the lateral aspect. It's like an intercostal approach to the paravertebral space, aiming to traverse the internal intercostal membrane here, and you can see where that target is of the paravertebral space. Now, actually, I find this technique easier in patients who have a larger body mass index, and actually, the novice practitioners who I've taught over the years, most of them, with one exception, find this approach easier. The only caution, of course, and why some people stay away from this technique is that it's encouraging you to drive your needle towards the center on your axis. So that's something you've got to be very careful about. What about positioning of the patient? Broadly speaking, there are three options. You can have the patient sitting in the lateral or even the semi-prone position or in the prone position. So I started off, my initial preference to have, was to have all of my patients in the sitting position. Uh, and certainly this was how I did the first probably three years of paravertebral block insertion. It's great for the paramedian sagittal approach. Once you start using sedation, it becomes slightly problematic. 
Once you start lifting your arms away from the trunk and above shoulder level, you can easily fatigue and you definitely require an assistant to be there holding the patient. So it's actually relatively labor intensive for them. So for those reasons, it's not a technique I perform or I use a lot when I'm training. I then moved to the lateral or the semi-prone position. And actually, this was really nice when it came to needle insertion because actually it made a lot of sense. Uh, certainly when doing a transverse in-plane approach, the ergonomics made sense. Patients tolerated sedation in that position well. And actually for larger patients, it made paravertebral block insertion very easy. What I struggled with, however, was to explain to patients how to get into that position. They often found it challenging. Uh, so now I have reverted to having the patients in the prone position. That's where I prefer to do most of my paravertebral blocks. The key, and it's very evident here in this image, is to get the patient to abduct their arms. So it brings the medial border of the scapula away from the midline. It's absolutely paramount and key that you do that. And often if you put a pillow under the chest, it helps to get you a bit of a thoracic kyphosis, which can aid with uh, block insertion. So you can use this position for transverse in-plane, paramedian sagittal in-plane, they tolerate sedation very well, they feel comfortable, and I find it's a good position to get your patient in when you're training on the block. What about needle choice? Uh, there are, um, when I first started, I used to do uh, use a facet tip block. The issue, or facet, facet tip needle, the issue with that, of course, is you've got the sharp point of the needle aiming for that narrow space where the pleura is. So I now prefer to use a TUI needle because actually the Hooper tip is now aimed and it's pointing away from the pleura. It's actually much nicer to approach the paravertebral space uh, with the TUI needle. So I tend to use an 18 gauge TUI, although I know there are much smaller TUI needles available. Uh, and that's something I would recommend. How about what level should you choose? Well, the key is you choose the level that's kind of at the midpoint of your surgical insult. So for breasts, I tend to, to, to pick a single level at T2, T3, or T3, T4, but you could also aim to do four to five injections over that um, related dermatomal coverage. But my preferred technique is to use a single injection of 20 mils at, at, at about T2 or T3 for, for, uh, for breast surgery. What we do know is backed up by this paper, and again, if you scan that QR code, you'll get there. We know actually that if you do a single level paravertebral block and look at dermatomal coverage, it is equivalent to doing a five level paravertebral block. So one might question why, if it's just for analgesia, why you need to do multiple level punctures. What about what drug to choose? Um, I uh, have a preference for levopupivacaine because we have it easily accessible. If I'm doing bilateral blocks, then I would half the concentration, but any long-acting local anaesthetic is suitable. The only exception is if I'm doing awake surgery, but I won't spend any more time talking about that. What about tips? If you have the probe completely perpendicular to skin, and you insert your needle in plane at the midpoint of that probe, you'll see it beautifully. The issue with paravertebral blocks, however, is often you need to tilt the probe ever so slightly, so when you then insert your needle in plane, actually you don't see the needle throughout its whole trajectory. So the way to deal with this is to insert your needle, if you've got a degree of probe tilt, insert your needle ever so slightly off the probe midline and then you'll be able to see your needle much clearer. The other thing to talk about is when you're doing a paramedian sagittal scan and you get a beautiful view of two transverse processes on the screen, sometimes when needling in plane, the needle encounters the cordad transverse process. So one thing you could do is slide the probe a bit more careful add to remove that cordial transverse process out of the way, but then your needle of insertion is super steep. So an alternative is to do the paramedian sagittal oblique scan, which involves rotating the lower part of the probe out of the way. And that way, when you bring your needle in plane from cordad to careful add, you've got a lower bony impedance in your way. One caution or one thing of note if you just simply translate the probe, what will happen is the medial aspect of the probe shifts towards the lamina with a risk of central neuroaxis injection. So actually, we don't want to do that. When you rotate the cordial part of the probe, you want to pivot on the kephalad aspect. So actually, that's what you're doing. If you employ that tip, you'll find that makes a big difference. So that should help. A couple of block examples here. Here's a needle coming in plane. I'm using a seeker solution here. 
So as I advance the needle injecting small amounts of local anaesthetic and as I traverse that internal costal membrane, you'll notice the needle tip is not visualized clearly, but here you go, there's a needle tip and there's the depression of the pleura. Here's a paramedian sagittal, note the differing bony landmarks and there, even though the needle tip didn't look like it across the superior costotransverse ligament, you saw a very clear depression of the, of the pleura. So there's uh, a little hydro, hy, hydrolocation solution. And at that point, you notice the pleura drop. You can then advance your needle just that little bit further. What are the complications? Well, people often fear pneumothorax, but what's the true incidence? The truth is, it's probably lower than we realise. This paper from 2016, uh, actually in over 14 or 1400 blocks, they didn't find any clinically detected pneumothoraces. But the sceptics among you will say, well, actually, did they actually look for them? Well, here, this paper in 2020, um, with a greater number of paraverteral blocks, so some patients had multiple level and even bilateral blocks, they had no clinically detected uh, pneumothoraces or pleural punctures, but when they x-rayed all of the patients afterwards, they found that two of those patients had a pneumothorax on chest x-ray. And when they calculated the incidence of pneumothorax based upon the number of blocks preceded, uh, that were performed, they actually worked out the incidence of pneumothorax from the paravertebral blocks in this group was similar to the incidence of pneumothorax in patients having breast surgery alone without a paravertebral block. So the incidence is not zero, but it's much lower than we realise. The other thing, uh, there are many other complications, but the other thing amongst many that people are worried about is hypotension or sympathectomy. Actually, this is a patient uh, of mine who developed a Horner's syndrome postoperatively. And actually, I think a thoracic paravertebral sympathectomy is a good thing. And actually, John McDonald told me if you can spot which side your patients had their block on from recovery or PACU from just looking at their face, you know the block will work well. And actually, in my experience, this is certainly the case. And often we don't have issues with hypotension. So what's the end result? Uh, unbelievably, a grateful surgeon, but certainly grateful patients. So in summary, paravertebral block is an established technique. It's not a beginner's technique, but it's established and it's got a strong evidence base. Please make sure you fully monitor your patients and have IV access in situ. You've got the transverse and paramedian approaches. I prefer to use in plane, making sure you look for the needle tip. For a single shot block, 20 mils of local anaesthetic suffices, and actually the true incidence of pneumothorax is low. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. Uh, don't ask me why I've got a giraffe here, but it's a photograph I took myself, so I'm just showing that off. Um, and please don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Many thanks.